Our next speaker uh, probably doesn't need any introduction, but I will anyway, um, Jenny Smith. Jenny has been with the Trace Evidence um, uh, Trace Evidence Criminalistics at the Missouri State Highway Patrol Crime Lab for 21 years. She has a BS in Medical Technology and an MS in Pathology from the University of Missouri, Columbia. Jenny will be talking to us today on the current manufacturing trends in the tape industry. Like all manufacturing sectors, the tape industry is driven by profit margins. Jenny will discuss some of the changes in the pressure-sensitive tape market in response to supply and demand of the many different components that go into this product. Um, thank you, uh, Sue, and good morning to everyone. Um, tape is, uh, t I think tape is cool, too. Uh, well, it's not as it's not as sexy as paint is, but uh, it's it's kind of funny that over the years uh, the 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 most popular color for duct tape is still gray. You know how exciting is that? I, I don't know why that is. They try to change it, but about as exciting as it gets is camouflage tape, as some of you hunters might know. Uh, so um, I am a. I'm a bench chemist. I, uh, your other speakers are uh, from the industry. So I'm going to give you a, a perspective from the bottom up, uh, from, from the bench, and the changes that we are likely to see or have been seen in, in tape analysis uh, in the last five or 10 years compared to like the 1990s. And it's all driven by uh, cost. They, try, they change components to uh, lower their cost at trying to give their consumers the same quality product or else to convince their, them they're getting the same quality product for uh, a lesser cost on their part. <clears throat> um, I, I've had help um, in this, this part of the talk, the major manufacturers uh, by um, visiting with a few retired tape friends that I have, and they tell me that these uh, four companies uh, have been the major tape producers in the U.S. and Canada uh, the last five years. This has not changed a whole lot. Um, sure Tape uh, used to be called Shoe for Milts back in the 90s, and um, <clears throat> about 10 years ago, they used to major uh, uh, produce their tape under the name of Hinkle or Manco, and now they uh, produce a lot of tape under the name of Hinkle. They still pr uh, produce uh, tapes with their own name on it, Sure Tape. Uh, the Intertape Polymer Group um, has remained under that name for many years, but they have changed some of the companies they have bought, the lesser companies that are now under their umbrella, and they market a lot of their tape under Tessa. Uh, the Tessa name now. <clears throat> uh, Barry is a company I'm, I'm not, um, I don't see on a lot of tapes, uh, but they market their tape under uh, principally the name of Kendall Polican and Nashua now. Uh, the, those other tapes, Tyco used to be huge until they fell from grace in the market, and uh, they, they owned some of these other companies, but they have been uh, usurped under the bigger umbrella of Barry. So these, these kind of do like a little um, market dance um, over the years, but that doesn't affect us a whole lot um, at front on the bench. Um, basic tape construction, there's two types of tape we see more than any others, and that's the vinyl um, tapes and the uh, black electrical tapes that um, uh, we see wrapped around uh, improvised explosive devices and other things. And, <clears throat> and also duct tape is, is very uh, commonly submitted as evidence. So those will be mainly the two things uh, I'll be trying to address briefly today. And uh, it's a, uh, this is a very basic representation of the uh, construction of these two types of tapes. Of course, duct tape has a reinforcement fiber in the center. They both have a backing and adhesive. 
Most of the time, the vinyl tapes are PVC, although they can be polypropylene or polyethylene. Well, then they're not vinyl tapes anymore, are they? They're, they're black electrical tapes, okay. Um, duct tape uh, is almost always polyethylene, unless you get into the clear, well, so-called clear duct tapes, which I think they're not even duct tape. And if they're clear, they're usually a polypropylene backing and have a different adhesive, so. Um, um, this shows you kind of, um, the the layers of a uh, of a piece of uh, well, this would be a, a reinforcement tape such as ba uh, duct tape or strapping tape, um, and it will have a release coat, backing, primer, reinforcement fabric, um, and adhesive. I list the materials there. In, in the blue boxes to show you the wide variety um, that those different layers can take on. So it kind of demonstrates what a complex product this is and all those components can change. So, um, and it's in response to, uh, again, market fluctuations and low bid components and um, so that's good for us, though, because it, it lends variability to this product. If they didn't change much over the years, um, then there wouldn't be much uh, uh, significance to even comparing duct tapes or other tapes. <clears throat> if you learn nothing else from this talk, just um, hope I impress upon you that Within each class of these tapes, they're not all the same within each class, although some classes of tapes have more variability than others, have more complexity, like duct tape is one of the most complex of them all. And you go down to uh, masking tape is one of the least complex. Um, and change is constant. And that's because uh, of market fluctuations. Uh, in rubber, petroleum, labor, and foreign competition. <clears throat> oh, wait, one more com I'd like to make a comment on the rubber. Um, they were, um, there was some report of um, a housing boom in Indonesia where um, there was, there had been a downturn in the, in the rubber market, so the rubber tree plantations decided to cut down their rubber trees and and uh, build housing development. So, and then uh, there was a great greater demand for rubber. Price of rubber went up. So now they're scurrying around to replant their rubber tree plantations, and that takes eight to ten years. So there's this gradual shift back and forth, supply and uh, demand. Of course, we know petroleum costs to have gone up, and uh, there's a lot of petroleum products in, in tape, so they're always looking for ways to go to a cheaper um, um, component that can replace the petroleum product. Uh, labor cost, as uh, if labor in other countries is cheaper than labor in the U.S., for instance, um, there's going to be uh, shifting of manufacturing to other countries. And of course, foreign competition for the market. <clears throat> uh, primarily in duct tape components, uh, in the backing, you can find uh, any one of these. I mean, most predominantly, you're always going to find polyethylene, uh, but and then these other things can vary. Uh, the, the presence of EMA or EVA, or uh, those are uh, copolymers of. Uh, polyethylene and uh, methyl acrylate uh, and polyethylene and vinyl acetate. Uh, you can also have a filler now in duct tape backings. Uh, plus, I haven't seen mica, but I hear it can be there. Of course, aluminum is the colorant and uh, carbamates um, are, is used as a release coat, whereas it used to be that you'd see more uh, polydimethyl siloxane as a release coat. But we don't really... Re worry too much about release coats because we can't hardly um, analyze them or extract them. 
<coughs> the scrim fabric in, in uh, duct tapes is always changing. Uh, it can be all it can be all cotton. Well, that's that's rare. That is something that is changing you. Uh, just about um, the only thing you see all cotton fabric reinforcement in now is still gaffer's tape. Uh, but <clears throat> we see uh, any variety of cotton and polyester blends. It can be all polyester or all cotton. The adhesive components. Um, these are very subject to market trend changes, natural rubbers, synthetic rubbers, and all the full array of um, fillers. Uh, and sometimes uh, those are, um, uh, sometimes one company will keep the same filler for many, many years, um, but <laughs> they can throw you for a loop sometimes. So they'll use dolomite for many years from the same mine in one part of the country and then they get um, a, a low bid dolomite from another mine and it can change the characteristics of your filler uh, or magnesium ratios to uh, aluminum. Um, so these are good things for us, of course. It, it lends a little more um, distinctiveness to the tape. Um, <clears throat> variability in tape uh, manufacturing, we can always find differences between duct tapes manufactured at different plants. There's just too many components there that they just don't share or don't or try to keep secret from one another. It's a highly proprietary industry, as many of the others are. <coughs> you can often find differences uh, between batches of duct tape that are manufactured at the same plant. Like I said, they'll, they'll get their dolomite from one mine and then the next week they get it from another mine or they decide they're not gonna use dolomite, now they use calcite. And, um, or they're not gonna use calcium carbonate at all um, and use talc. So um, there can be all kinds of changes like that, which the normal consumer isn't gonna notice that difference, but we're gonna notice that difference. Um, and sometimes we can even find differences uh, between rolls of tape that are manufactured within the same batch. And that is due, well, uh, particularly in duct tape. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, primarily that's due to um, the different, uh, the, the slitters that um, slit these, these big sheets of film into the rolls, individual two-inch rolls that are commonly marketed for duct tape. Um, these slitters aren't exactly the same millimeter width, so it can be stated as a 50.8 millimeter width, but it can be anywhere from 48 to 52 millimeters, and, and you will detect that. And they could have been cut from the same sheet. Uh, also, that um, you can have a difference in the machine offset um, the, of the yarns from the edge. And again, these are good things for us. But it, it's um, as long as the manufacturing, a lot of times uh, they might get better at uh, having uniform widths on the same roll, but right now, um, uh, that equipment hasn't changed much. Duct tape backings. Um, in the 90s, we didn't see much single, single layer tapes. Occasionally you would, uh, but it was a little bit uh, unusual to see a multi-layered tape in the 90s. Now it is probably we see more of that than the single layer tapes, so this is this is quite a market um, change. And uh, the industry people, and I should mention Jerry Sarah, who is retired from covalence tape, and of course my friend John Johnston, um, uh, they're both tape research chemists. Uh, they've been really good friends over the years and helped me. Um, they say that this change, you would think going from a single layer to a triple layer or a double layer would be more expensive. This is the, the triple layer is a co-extruded tape, um, 
but they explained that that aluminum powder that goes into the, uh, makes that gray color, it's cheaper if they only put it in one layer. <clears throat> Rather than having the entire layer colored, they just color one layer and we consumers can't see the difference. Um, in the tie layer, there's a trend toward more low point um, polyethylene. It, um, the last few years, it's with that tire layer, we have seen um, EVA and EMA. The scrim fabric, there is a trend toward um, the knitted fabric, which is a weft insertion uh, fabric. And um, of course, there's always global rubber market fluctuations causing changes in the adhesives. And depending on where they get their rubber, it can be a different color, so that adhesive color will change continually. Uh, here's a look at some of the, um, a, a cross section. And this was uh, contributed uh, by Andrea Hobbs from the FBI lab. Thank you, Andrea, for this photo. It, um, it shows a single layer at the top, and uh, the bottom one is uh, three layers with aluminum in the middle. Uh, the bottom layer uh, is uh, the tie coat. It, is, uh, it can be one of three, th three things that EVA or EMA, or now, as I explained, that there's a trend toward using the low melt polyethylene. Uh, that tie, oh yeah, okay, I just said this, tie layer uh, in the co-extruded tapes. And what it does is when you, when you remove that adhesive and the backing, or adhesive and the fabric from your duct tape backing, uh, in these co-extruded tapes, you will see an imprint of the uh, fabric. And what you're looking at is the, is the underside of the adhesive film here and you see the imprint that was left by the, the, the fabric reinforcement, the scrim fabric. And so this is, this is um, how it helps to uh, bond the backing to the adhesive. Uh, the, P, uh, the polyethylene um, is, is lower cost. And what they have done to... Um, replace EVA and EMA with the low point polyethylene is just to um, uh, you use it at a little higher temperature. And so then it will, it will um, allow those fibers to be embedded in that layer. <coughs> Here's a, a comparison of co-extruded and laminate fill. We're seeing more of the co-extrude, and that again is the multi-layer backing. Uh, this is uh, the type of weaves we were seeing in the mid-90s um, in these two different tapes. These are just uh, normal basket weave kind of um, a woven scrim. Uh, this we're seeing more of. It's a weft insertion. It's a knitted fabric. And it's an all polyester uh, in the warp yarns and the fill yarns are all polyester. But uh, the whole point of having uh, cotton generally in your warp yarns is that so you can tear it. You have to be able to tear duct tape across with your hands. You don't want to have a dispenser, especially if you're a criminal and you're in a hurry to get it cut. <laughs> So um, this, this knitted fabric does, although it is polyester in the warp yarns, it, it will tear across easily. The, the, it comes unknitted. Uh, there, there is kind of a trend also but, uh, toward this heat bonded polyester. And here you can see a close up of one of those intersections where it's, it's been melted and uh, melted together. In general, um, we used to see um, a lot more kale and clay in the adhesive fillers. And this was found in all the, the uh, various tape products. We're seeing less kale and clay for reasons I'm not sure of. And we're seeing more calcium carbonate now in the, uh, the last 10 years. Um, 
With regard to vinyl tapes, um, lead carbonate uh, in the U.S. marketed backings uh, has been uh, replaced. Um, you can still find lead carbonate in um, foreign products, foreign tapes. <clears throat> Phthalates, uh, the vinyl and the chloride of um, black electrical tapes have um, lost favor because of, well, they're toxic. <laughs> and uh, substitutes are being sought. We might see more water-based acrylics and adhesives in the future, especially in the um, foreign market. Uh, the lead carbonate um, that was used as a stabilizer prior to 2002 has been replaced by barium and zinc um, components. Uh, the vinyl, uh, the chloride, and the phthalates of the PVC tapes uh, has, as I said, are a health hazard. And um, in, in Europe, in fact, you're seeing a lot more of what's called a fleece tape. And it is a uh, polyethylene um, uh, texturized polyethylene uh, uh, felt backing, and they use it primarily in automotive harness tapes. In general, and this is regard to clear packaging tapes, um, we didn't used to see inorganic fillers in these tape adhesives. Well, they're clear. You don't want anything uh, interfering with the transmission of light through these, but they have started putting fillers in them. We see calcium car carbonate regularly in these, but it, for some reason, it doesn't. It's not enough in there to uh, make them opaque. Uh, and in general, also compared to 1995, the production of tape in the U.S. has decreased, while Asian production has increased. So the only constant in tape production is that you can expect it to change all the time. So um, I would like to thank um, the talented and knowledgeable scientists at the um, FBI lab and the chemistry unit, unit Andrea and Maureen and, and Diana, um, who really know more about tape trends than I do. And I, I appreciate their help. And in fact, I appreciate the FBI in general for their support and uh, information that they give us over the years, and they've been a very valuable resource. So that concludes what I have to say about tape. Databases. Um, there's little databases all over the place. Um, and there has been talk of establishing a nationwide duct tape database. And, um, and there has been some searchable ones. I think Slice, the um, Spectral Library, had a searchable duct tape database on Slice. Um, you know, this whole panel is about new developments in manufacturing. This is not a panel they would have at a DNA conference. Because, I mean, what do you talk about? Oh, oh, we have a new line of hominids in, uh, in East Timor. Or <laughs> we, we discontinued these hominids over, <clears throat> over here. And so oh, we have a new component, new DNA component, and, and they don't, you know, we have a new race that's emerged. So <laughs> they, we have a challenge. We have a challenge. And there is definitely a place for um, databases. But we have an added challenge uh, with, with these manufacturing or these manufactured products such as duct tape because of the constant change. And uh, the, another challenge is like, for instance, let's say uh, Wiley Coyote 
<clears throat> goes out and buys um, a case of duct tape from Acme Tape Company. <laughs> and Acme doesn't really produce its own tape, let's say, for instance, which is very common. For instance, like Hinkle does not produce tape. They buy Sure Tape and market it under Hinkle. Well, Acme <clears throat> might be uh, buying their tape from um, manufacturer A and marketing under an Acme name, and they might also be having a higher grade product from manufacturer B, and manufacturer B might be getting their, their tape from China, are part of it. So you get a mix and match of all these different um, um, parts and under different names. So <clears throat> if you're trying to match the tape on the Roadrunner, <laughs> the Roadrunner was tied up with, to a certain company, Acme could have bought their tape from several places. And, and you would have a heck of a time trying to find out just where that tape came from, if, particularly if you didn't find that Roadrunner for five or 10 years. <laughs> the tape is going to change a lot in that amount of time. So we have an added challenge, and there has been attempts. And there is a place for databases. It's just um, a continually changing market, and uh, the target is, is moving all the time. <clears throat> Stefan Becker from the BKA in Germany. I just want to get a small comment on it. The NFC European Paint and Glass Group, they are working on a database for tape. Actually, there is one existing. Mainly, they are focusing on uh, physical properties and describing what's going on and what's around there. Certainly, it's only based for the European market, but just to let you know that something is around that and maybe over some connection between the SWIG, MED, and EPG, there can be an exchange in the future also. Uh, thank you for that, uh, for that comment. And I, I would like to, I'd like to comment further. The value of databases isn't always for sourcing a tape, but establishing the, the variability of that product. So that when you go into a courtroom, you can say, yeah, not all duct tape is the same. See, for instance, we've got, you know, a thousand different variations right here. And look at this database here. Or I entered it into this database in of, of 2,000 tapes, and I, don't, I, I, I only got one hit. Uh, you know, so 